In the mid-1920s, a young man, Themistocles, was forced to flee his hometown in the Black Sea region and relocate to Greece. His last name was Deirmenji, which means Miller in Turkish. Hence, my last name, Milonas, which means Miller in Greek. He was my paternal grandfather. Themistocles was fluent in Turkish and Ponte Greek, a form of Greek closer to ancient than modern Greek. When he arrived in Greece, he was, uh, it was suggested to him that he change his name. He translated it into Greek, and he did. He was also a Christian Orthodox, and that made him a prime candidate for the obligatory population exchange in, of 1923 between Greece and Turkey. Themistocles met his wife, Ekaterini, at a refugee village. She was a refugee from Novorossiysk in Russia, the daughter of a Greek merchant and a Russian housewife. Ekaterini um, only spoke Russian when she arrived in the Greek harbor of Thessaloniki, fleeing the Bolshevik Revolution, which overthrew the Romanov dynasty and put an end to the Russian Empire. My maternal grandfather, Haralampos, was born and raised in the island of Crete. During the Second World War, he fought against Italian fascism on the Albanian front. After the armistice of 1941, he settled in a rural area in northern Greece and married Sofia, another refugee from Pontus, just like Themistocles. The Ottoman authorities, the Ottoman Empire, targeted the Ponte Greek population with exclusionary policies. And the Turkish state continued these policies after it succeeded the Ottoman Empire. These policies ultimately led to the forced deportation of the Mistocles and Sophia, and the two families settled in northern Greece. Now, while my grandparents were targeted by exclusionary policies, their children and themselves were targeted by assimilationist ones by the Greek state. My father, after serving in the Greek military as a reserve officer, moved to my mother's hometown. And despite the distinct respective backgrounds, they got married three years later. My sister and I consider ourselves Greek. Neither of us speaks the languages that our grandparents spoke. Neither of us identifies with any of the subnational ethnic identities. We are a living proof of the successful Greek nation building. Greek governing elites uh, pursued and promoted or propagated a Greek national narrative over any other in the country. My family history may not be unique, but I think it has already given you a sense of a pretty drastic change that happened around that time. If you were to look at the ma a map of the world in the early 1800s, three-fifths of it would be covered by empires. Empires ruled through dynastic right. Dynastic right maintained a wide gulf between the ruling elites and those governed by, by them. In year 2000, the map is almost completely covered exclusively covered, almost, by nation states, establishing equality between members of, um, members of an imagined community constituting a nation. Nation building operated as a vaccination against future foreign influence. This foreign influence was particularly pernicious when it was coming from what we can call non-core groups, groups unassimilated by the to the core group of, of a nation state. Nation building policies were pursued by various nation states in order to homogenize their nations. Governments pursued nation building when they were faced with um, fluid borders, fierce territorial competition, and enemy-backed groups perceived as um, undermining the state from within, what we called fifth columns. 
while not all fifth columns are actual fifth columns, what matters is the perception of these groups by the ruling elites. Let me now turn to a story that can help us um, understand the role of perceptions in identifying fifth columns. This story comes from the very early years of the Greek War of Independence against the Ottoman Empire. In 1821, the Greek rebels tried to get independence from the empire. The Sultan, Mahmoud II, was certain from the very beginning that the Russians were backing this revolt. But he was wrong. How do we know? We know because the intelligence reports that he was receiving at the time by his own people were assuring him that there was no Russian connection, at least in the beginning. However, the Sultan was certain about this, and he kept on writing so on the side of these reports with handwritten notes, telling them that not only the Russians were assisting the Greek rebels, but they were actually provoking the very rebellion. Now, the identity of the leader of the Greek revolt at the time, Alexander Sipsilandis, was proof enough for this. He was a major general in the Russian army. He was a personal friend of Tsar Alexander, the Russian Tsar. And his father was an Ottoman dignitary who had fled, uh, who had actually defected to Russia. The Russians did everything they could to appease the Sultan and to signal that they were not backing the Greek rebellion. They discharged Ypsilantis from their army, and they also um, decided to offer help to crush the rebellion. Nothing could appease the Sultan. The reprisals on the Greeks were extensive and brutal. As my family history, I think, has made it very clear, nation building is not a one-size-fits-all process. So what determines whether a group is going to be targeted with exclusion or assimilation? When a group has no external links, it's very likely to be targeted with assimilationist policies, such as mass cooling with national content or military conscription just like the ones my family experienced in Greece. When a group is backed by an allied power, an allied external actor, it's very likely that it will be accommodated through minority rights. The logic here being that the cost of accommodating the group is lower than the benefits you get from the alliance with the external actor. Finally, revisionist elites who are interested in changing the international order um, are going to pursue exclusionary policies when they're faced with enemy-backed groups. You all remember that that was the way that my Ponte Greek ancestors were treated. So that's a, an example of that. Now, you may be wondering, sitting here, why all this should matter to you. It does matter, actually, because Nation building is not a thing of the past. We're going to experience a lot more nation building in the future. And here is why. First, many parts of the world, as I indicated earlier, have not gone through nation building, which means uh, that they may have new cycles of nation building in the future. Either because their elites, as I said, did not have enough incentives to actually pursue nation building, or because they pursued nation building, but they were just unsuccessful. Think of the thousands of unassimilated groups in the world that actually um, live in just about 200 countries. This mismatch between the number of unassimilated groups and the number of countries in the world involves important conflict potential. Second, we're destined to see a lot more nation building in relation to the proliferation of dual nationality policies around the world. The recent accusations of dual loyalties are a case in point. The risk of diasporic communities being targeted or perceived uh, as security threats is real. Finally, global inequalities 
and climate change are, are sure to mi increase migration flows. Now, in turn, this means we're gonna see a lot more unassimilated migrant groups around the world. And this will spare new cycles of nation building. So you may be wondering, what can we do? If we want to promote multicultural arrangements and we want governments to adopt multicultural arrangements, we need to foster interstate alliances through regional integration schemes, open trade, and international institutions. To prevent exclusionary policies, the United Nations Security Council and the international community at large should uphold the principle of territorial integrity. This is one way to minimize external interference, since it will look like it's futile or ineffective to aspiring external backers. Now, you may be wondering, what can we do with groups that are already at risk, and multiple are today? If a government wants to support the group already at risk, it needs to be particularly cautious if that group resides in a rival country. To avoid exclusionary policies, it needs to be fully determined and act fast and decisively. Finally, and counterintuitively, if we want to improve relations between core and non-core groups within one country, we must first focus on improving relations between countries. Drawing from the traumatic experiences of Haralampos and Sofia, Themistocles and Ekaterini, I tried to share some ideas about the origins and the logic of nation building. I also tried to explain what's the impact of nation building on our sense of identity. But also at an aggregate level, I tried to point to the ways that nation building has affected the world around us, namely the contemporary nation state system is a product of nation building. Lastly, I tried to recommend some ways to avert exclusionary policies in the future. As the architecture of the post-World War II order is being challenged today, these ideas, I believe, are worth spreading. <laughs>